So welcome Andy Forks to this edition of Tech Pets the podcast and it is fantastic to meet you. You are a special correspondent for military simulation and training at Halldale and can you tell us a bit more about that role? Yeah, so, uh, well, I, I can say a bit more. I mean, I, I got into journalism by accident, really, later in life. So it just shows a, a late career change. I was kindly asked to be editor of military simulation training, which has been going for 40 years. We write about uh, military simulation training, amazingly. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we obviously our audiences are military and industry and anyone else is interested, really. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, so that that's where we hopefully are trusted talking about this. And uh, it's a, a really interesting area. It never ceases to uh, keep changing and uh, adapting. But uh, so, yeah, I was uh, asked to be editor in 2019. And then I did it for a year and decided I wasn't quite editor, wasn't fully for me at that time. And I'm now a special correspondent. So I write stories, particularly with uh, talking about technology um, and some of the shows that have been going on, like iTech, there was quite a few shows uh, just trying to keep up uh, with technology, which is uh, quite challenging at the moment. And I guess for this uh, episode, I, I did write a story about the military metaverse in 2020. So uh, hopefully I didn't start all this hype, but <laughs> it was, uh, I was, because I, I'm, I'm really uh, fascinated with the history of, of, of this technology area of what I would broadly call simulation and particularly simulation and training. Perfect. And that's what we are here to talk to talk about tonight. Yes, right. So a huge amount of our audience will have come across the term metaverse. But when you try and drill down into what that actually means, especially for defense, you know, yeah. what is what is the metaverse? I know, and uh, some people categorically say what it is, and other people say, "Well, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not interested in know it. I know exactly what it is." But I think it's a bit like saying, "What is the internet?" It really depends, or what is cyberspace? It really depends what uh, you know, what, what perspective you're you're looking at this subject. But I, I think I always go back um, to the when when it was first coined in 1992, Snow Crash, uh, Neil Stevenson, and he he coined it which is meta beyond universe, uh, beyond the universe. So and he was imagining a world, because at the time there wasn't really much of an internet at all. And actually it was more interested, he was more interested in video. And he was imagining a world, what, what would happen if you had interactive 3D video? And, and that's, and, and some of it was all about the goggles or the VR, virtual reality, how you engage with it. But really the story is about how people were being sucked into these digital worlds and living kind of having personas in this digital world and then it impacted on their real lives as well in sometimes as rather un unfortunate ways which in many ways I'd say we're we're already there except I would say the metaverse is in a sense a more three-dimensional version of the internet but uh, lots of people say well there's already you know three-dimensional people already spending lots of time in gaming people you know talk about Fortnite and uh, Roblox people spend a lot of time there Second Life has been going a long time. So, yeah, I, it, for me, anyway, I'm not, the, I'm not the categorical authority, <laughs> but for me, it is going back to the roots of where it came from. And there is kind of one metaverse, which is a world that people live in and spend their time in, this digital world. And I think it's a fascinating uh, area of science fiction and so forth. It's funny that you should say science fiction because it really does hark back to kind of ideas in novels that was something that seems completely unreal and now it's very much a reality but how does how does the metaphor metaverse and defense come together yeah so this is why i i, I wrote a, a little uh, little story or article in 2020 because I, I was just seeing this word and it obviously had been around 30 years and it was just having a little bit more interest this is before facebook uh, turned into meta and all the uh, hype surrounding that. And it was, but it fundamentally, it, it, I was thinking, well, this is very similar to what the military, you know, we want to be able to, because I, you know, in the military, whether you're planning for, you know, war or planning, conf, you know, going into conflict tomorrow or training for tomorrow, or you're doing analysis for the future, you know, looking years ahead, at the end of the day, you, you're trying to simulate things before you do it. And uh, it just seemed to me that, as, as we've become in a much more digital world, that is becoming you know, much 
easier, I suppose. Also, a lot of my article was about the, the you know, was, was it because Neil Stevenson actually was seeing what the military were doing even then? Because in the 1980s, the US had linked uh, over 200 simulators together and they were, uh, you know, army simulators and Navy and uh, an air force or, or certainly uh, you know very you know uh, tanks uh, tanks ships and aircraft and they link them all in this one world and connecting them all was this sort of internet or at the time it was they called a sort of simulation internet so the military were kind of living in this virtual world or training in this virtual world and they were used the same technology to do experiments as well try and work out is there better ways of fighting in this sort of so-called simnet and you know that was that was before neil stevenson wrote um snow crash so it's kind of interesting whether neil stevenson had actually seen what the military were doing i don't think it was classified and even you know in 1993 there was uh, uh, people were writing about what the u.s military had done and then they also linked it across the atlantic to various of their u.s establishments in in there so it was quite an amazing an achievement, and uh, sadly, you know, all those. <laughs> it isn't really easily possible for the military just to jump on a simulation like a game now and do that. That was really what they were doing then. They they then tried to recreate using similar technology, uh, the first Gulf War, and they they basically recreated what had happened in the simulation, so they they could learn from that as well. So, I think um, you know, and since then the military have been linking you know, live training with simulation. So you instrument the live training. I'm sure any soldiers have gone over, soldiers who plane have been, know about that, been instrumented, or even, you know, uh, aircraft can instrument so that when you do the debriefing, but of course you can connect those to the virtual simulations, maybe, you know, like a flight simulator on the ground and, you know, mix it up. And that is called live virtual constructive, uh, which is pretty similar to what I would say a military metaverse is that idea that you've linked all your simulations together for various reasons. It may not be for training, but be for a whole range of activities you want to sort of predict the future kind of idea. And uh, yeah, so it, that for me is what a military metaverse is. But crucially, you've got to connect it all together persistently, and it's going to be easy for the military just to jump on. It's really interesting because the way that you talk about it, it sounds like it's been going on forever. Um, not forever, but for longer than I think the word metaverse has probably been bandied around because it does seem to pop up a lot and it feels pretty fresh and new. But from your point of view, do you think the companies that are developing this technology or have been developing it for years, um, do you think that it's still a growth industry? Do you think it's something that people should keep their eyes on for something to potentially get into or has it had its heyday? Oh, no. I, I mean, I think, uh, oh, no, <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> I, is, is, I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger. I think uh, it, it becomes even more per, per, uh, pervasive across the defence. I mean, it's very, even the military network now, I mean, I work in industry, but I used to be in MOD and I still work on defence, you know, work. And I just see that you know, the, 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 I don't want to sort of knock the MOD too much, but I, 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 so many things are locked down. Uh, you can't use even teams. Some things are locked down, even cameras. So there's a long way to go before the military are going to have this sort of world that they can jump in. But if you could imagine a world where, you know, you've developed all your systems in this virtual world or digital world, and you've trained on these systems before they even start cu cutting metal. Um, and then through life, as the system changes then it updates uh automatically you know the training automatically updates when the uh, the systems are get updated which is something that doesn't really happen very well so there's so much more to happen um even the interfaces with these sort of virtual worlds like i mean it isn't all about putting a headset on but obviously that's what people imagine uh, using virtual reality but that technology is just you know it's it's really i mean as a journalist um, it's very difficult to keep up with what's going on, the rate of change in technology. So I think the real challenge is how military can actually in any way keep up with some of this stuff. So um, I hopefully got from that that I think that the military, you know, in a way, I mean, if you look at, say, gaming, 
uh, there's quite a lot of people who've come from the gaming world have gone into defence because they actually enjoy that kind of work. Obviously, here we're talking about people who've maybe been in the military, or and so it's not quite the same. But I think anyone who's got an interest in these things, I think it can only get more and more. This, you know, that it's basically about, I guess, the cyber digital world without, you know, drawing lines between things. It's to, to me anyway. It's the future of the digital, future of the digital world. If you um, if you were looking for a career change and you had a gaming background or you know a background in military training, what would be your top five companies to look at and try and get a foot in with right now? I mean, I don't know whether I should. Am I allowed to name companies I, I like to work with? I yeah, well, it's your, it's your personal opinion, so it doesn't have to be companies that you work yeah. with, just the ones that you are watching or admire or think they're going to go places. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing about uh, jobs after the military is that um, I think there are, are still people hungry to employ people uh, out of the military with the skills that, okay, they may not be the exact digital skills that are looking for, but I'm sure people can you know get trained up and you know but if they've got the background if they know what the customer wants i think those are really uh you know there's a real hunger for those sorts of people um i know i work very closely but i prefer to work with like, the smaller companies <laughs> but I, I think um myself but that doesn't mean you shouldn't obviously work with big contractors there's pros and cons to both uh having worked in big mod i decided i wanted to work in small <laughs> industry but yeah there are, there are some really nice uh little companies out there and I'm afraid if I start naming them, someone's going to say, well, why didn't you say, <laughs> say, <laughs> say me? But I mean, there are some military or veteran owned, uh, wholly vet veteran companies. Uh, D3A comes to mind. Uh, there's other companies, service in the, certainly the army side. Um, uh, so I think Bohemia, I used to work for Bohemia Interactive Simulations. They, a lot of the people there actually are ex-military, even though, uh, I mean, I should explain that that is a company that started taking game software and turned it into military training software. They sell it across the world now. But so some of those people are military more than they are gaming people, but they know about what military want. So I think like in any industry, knowing what the customer wants, but also you can't stand still because what the customer wants changes. So you can't, I think that's the other thing. You've got to be really interested in what's going on. I mean, obviously the war in Ukraine has changed, you know, I think, you know, how UK defence responds to that and whether it's quick enough to change to see what's going on there is an interesting question. But coming back to companies, yeah, I mean, there's some really big companies, your Lockheed Martins, uh, BA Systems, uh, Raytheon, um, there's a lot of companies under Selborne, which if you're Navy, you've probably heard of that. Um, and as I know they look for people um, and I know they're trying to innovate as well. Um, so I think, um, I mean, the primes have an advantage that, you know, they, they're generally quite stable. <laughs> so if you're, say, working on a training system, it's, it's, it gives you stability. Um, but I think sometimes, I mean, you could start your own business as well. <laughs> That's the other thing. I think it's relatively, I've seen people do that. It's tough, though. Um, to win work but once you're in there with the defense and a kind of trusted source i think it's you know it's a good 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 business to be in so um yeah i I'm, there, there are other companies they will come to mind but i don't want to see two <laughs> i mean cae though big yeah there's i i'd say it really you've got to look at your life and think how much stability or excitement do i want i mean i'm not saying jobs in big prime contractors isn't exciting but i think it'd be a bit more exciting in a small company and so i guess that's uh, it depends on your financial situation um and also i think i think it's always good if you've worked in defense in a small company you could always you know those skills are highly transferable to other sectors so i think um yeah i think i, I would say it's a very good area to be in if hopefully I've explained it. And <laughs> no, you have. You've done, a, you've done a brilliant job of explaining it. And I think because I keep seeing, um, you know, some of the bigger players like Splunk, um, you know, 
potentially wanting to dip their foot into the, the simulation training market. Um, was there another company, it begins with an O, that was recently um, sold out, and I can never remember what it's called. Um, Is this improbable? Or... Yes, it's improbable. It doesn't begin with an O, it begins with an I. <laughs> um, I think Hadian's another one that springs to mind. Yeah, yeah, no, I've, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, you put me on the spot of remembering companies. Yeah, Hadian, in fact, interestingly, Hadian have come from more of the civil world and, and breaking into defence. So that's very interesting uh, seeing, seeing that happen. So I, I think there will be flows backwards and forwards. And I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I would say this, but I, I think the military is actually still quite a, a, a head in terms of its understanding about what it actually wants. It's just the challenge of, of trying to join up or the join up everything in the defence is incredibly challenging. So uh, you mentioned um, the war in Ukraine. Have you seen any advances or swift changes when it comes to simula simulation and training with regard to the metaverse, kind of lessons learned so far that are being implemented or are being tried to be implemented? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I mean, I've not seen directly, but I know the people, some of the companies I mentioned, like uh, uh, Bohemia and some of the games engine companies, uh, we, did, we haven't mentioned those. Uh, there's Unity, uh, Epic Games. Certainly people are creating content to reflect what's going on there. And what is, I guess, exciting is really the wrong word in this context. But I think I think it's so much quicker to do things now than it used to be. So people can create, um, you know, the latest uh, imagery of, of, say, Ukraine, that all the uh, vehicles or aircraft can be created in simulation far quicker than it used to be when I when I was in the MOD, uh, when people were in Afghanistan, it took took it took too long, bluntly, to update the simulators to reflect the uh, to reflect what was going on in Afghanistan. So they were still training on in Europe, European terrain when they were going out to Afghanistan, and, and not really the same at all. Um, so, but now I think it's a lot quicker to to do that. And you, what you're also seeing. I mean, in terms of the future of war, you're seeing where people are collecting this data, whether it's from satellite, whether it's from the ground, using existing data, and you're seeing, you know, the population itself giving information. You can imagine all that going into this, you know, 3D kind of world. So commanders can get a much better view of what's going on. And that same world could be used for mission preparation and so forth. So I think, uh, I think what Ukraine's showing is that you know, the time, you just don't have time. You've got to get on with things really quickly. And I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I was reading The Economist, a uh, very recent article about, you know, the transparency. There's nowhere to hide on the battlefield. So it's, yeah, I, I think it's only going to get more and more crucial that, you know, uh, beyond all the hype of the metaverse, the idea that you can link up all your systems and get a clear view, which could be used for various things, whether it's intelligence or... Uh, yeah, as I say, mission preparation, which inter interestingly was a vision from you know as a, long ago as the late seventies. So none of the none of the none of the uh, none of the ideas that all been had, but it's just now technology you can see is really catching up. And then we haven't we haven't said AI yet, have we? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, oh, no. That's how does AI word. come into the, how how does AI come into the picture with regard to the metaverse? So. Um, well, if we go back to SimNet in the 80s, they realised that, in the 1980s, that is, <laughs> the 1880s, they realised that actually, instead of, because they needed an enemy, you know, so you were in a simulation, you were fighting the enemy. Now, you didn't really want the enemy to have loads of role players, humans, so they wanted to have what were they called semi-autonomous forces, so they, they one human could control a, a series of of enemy tanks within the simulation and so yeah again the military have been doing that sort of stuff for you know a long time um but i think that kind of scripted ai let's say but i think what we're seeing now with machine learning and now large language uh models is that that is potentially could uh you know make a dramatic i know again there's huge hype in that but uh I do think long term, you, know, you might be able to a bit like a holodeck, 
you know, you're, you've got your simulation on your barracks and you say, create me this and such and such, uh, you know, I want to be training in, in, in Western Ukraine or whatever this morning, or I want to be training in the Arctic or something like that. And so I think your AI could start to generate that kind of training environments and then it could be used to maybe keep track of people, uh, what, you know, and give them personalized learning. That's another big thing that people talk about. Um, yeah, and you know, even better AI to control what's going on in the simulation, going back to the old days. But of course, the interesting thing is that you could train your drones and train all your autonomous systems in the simulation, and then they go out into the real world <laughs> with the same programming. So, I mean, that is being done in the civil civil world. So, yeah, that's um, again, I think uh, hugely. Um, it, it's probably best. It's probably easy to over exaggerate the impact now, but in the long term, I think there'll be huge, huge changes there. Yeah, because basically in terms of creating the simulations, I don't think it will put anyone out of work because there's always there's always a human element to war. <laughs> so, yeah. How do you think the UK is faring in terms of, or UK MOD is faring in terms of adopting this tech getting people trained up, getting the systems in place, making the right partnerships with commercial organizations um, in comparison to say foreign militaries like Russia. Are we ahead of the game? Are we behind the game? Are we on a par? I, I always think it's really better to be ahead of the game. I, I, I'm not sure we are. Um, if someone could say we are, I, I think you look at the US uh, and they're invest they may not call it the metaverse, but I would say they're metaversian, <laughs> you know, having single worlds that I've just talked about, uh, having everything connected up, having a single world terrain that anyone can, you know, use. So, yeah, I would say they're, they're ahead. Uh, but there are other nations. Um, I, I think Netherlands always get are pretty well respected. If any other nations out there, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, think, I think the danger is... In defence, I'll just say, won't say UK, but we could all end up saying, spending a, half the day wor worrying about what the metaverse is rather than actually getting on, <laughs> getting on with it. And uh, I, I don't think I'm the only person to have said I think we're too slow. <laughs> um, I know. I, I think if I know, I think I think procurement, it's a, it's a, it is a challenge because I think you know there are let's say training systems. Uh, then, or even if you look at, say, training aircraft, for, you know, put simulation to one side, you, c you can't just sort of randomly buy a training aircraft <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's going to be looked after. And, you know, so there's a, a whole sense of longevity there. So you've got to have, you know, quite a big companies to, in a sense, to, to look after them. But when it comes to some of this technology, it just changes so quickly that, you know, that I think acquisition has to change, but I'm not sure anyone's, uh, found a way to do that. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I've done some work, quite a lot of work in XR or extended reality, virtual reality systems, and it is practically impossible to keep up with what's going on in terms of the because it's not necessarily because the whole world is buying VR goggles, but all the technologies within those goggles are all just uh, improving all the time, and they're also coming together at the same time. So this sort of exponential change and i don't know i think i think i mean security is a huge issue but there's a danger that if we worry about it too much you end up just doing nothing <laughs> so which of course is very easy <laughs> to do nothing so um yeah I, I think that's a really uh fascinating area not also because um going a bit off script here but i i it's also because these devices and are capturing so much data so it's it's data that can be used to um uh there are companies that are using data that's coming off these goggles to help just you know help work out what's good training so this company called vray who are working with the RAF on on that so they're taking data and using machine learning to work out what is good airmanship for the pilots so that's very exciting but on the other hand it's, they're generating huge amounts of data that can give away an awful lot about yourself, <laughs> even how high you are, what gender you are, even your, you know, and a whole host of things 
So there's a whole, whole uh, load of issues around privacy coming along. And then, you know, that applies to the military just as much as uh, I would say is just as much as security. So that, yeah, there are some real issues around data, um, so, which could hold you back if you worry about it all the time. But I think, um, um, yeah, so I, I think that's probably for another another long conversation, isn't it? How can we improve acquisition in defence? Yeah, I mean, that could be a very, a very, very, very long conversation. I really, I really, yeah, that's another journalist there. But I, I certainly, having worked my whole life, and my first job was in submarine procurement, I, I think um, I've kind of seen the sort of the digital side and the, the mechanical engineering side. So yeah, I I I think it I think the 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 thing for defence to do is somehow tailor tailor what you're spending and 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 the risks against you know the benefits and not apply the same rules to everything, which is what the case is now. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, and it's interesting when you you mentioned before about um, you know some companies actively recruiting ex-military when you talked about I think you said um was it service or bohemia interactive solutions who are have majority veteran owned uh, D3A oh D3A Delta um, 3 Alpha yeah Delta 3 Alpha what um when you've met the the people who work in that company what are what are their military backgrounds are they varied or are they all from kind of signals or intelligence um, varied. They're going to shoot me for not remembering. Uh, uh, um, Royal Marines and uh, and I, I would say artillery, forward air control type uh, side, M more land side. Uh, yeah, it doesn't mean they wouldn't welcome RAF or Navy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's just interesting because I think for people who are listening and, you know, whatever job they're in in the military, because there are so many jobs you can be in yeah. if they're looking at this sector as a growth sector and thinking do I have what it takes to make it what would you say from the people that you've met the ethos the culture what what would you say are the qualities that would help you to succeed in those kind of companies I I think fundamentally it's the enthusiasm to do the job really that you you think you're really excited that this is a really interesting area to be involved in that you you really want to sort of help the customer so because i think most people wouldn't be in defense unless they really wanted to be because uh, the, i wouldn't say that there's easy well there's possibly easier ways to make money but it's it can be a long slog and uh but i think you've got to feel like it's worth it and you know find it interesting and you know i i, I think if you've obviously served uh yeah, one would like to think obviously you're enthusiastic about what you're doing, but certainly and then enthusiastic about working in this field. And you know, you can't do the same job forever. Maybe you'll find another channel into some other area of um, of of industry. So, yeah, I, I'd say enthusiasm, which is, I know that sounds a bit like obvious motherhood and apple pie, but that's what I I notice. And and obviously, I think you're going to be curious. You're wanting to. Uh, you know, find out more because not everyone, you know, it's impossible to know everything. And it, it's such a an interesting area, I'd say particularly on training, but it's not just training. Um, but, you know, the sort of uh, where people and technology come together and there's no easy, there's no definitive answers to that's the best way people train or, or educate. I mean, we've got a good feeling about how they, <laughs> they are, <laughs> obviously. So, I mean, you know, and I would say, you know, most military are changing roles a lot, uh, and so they're used to change. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, you know, and you know, at the end of the day, most you have to leave sometimes. So I would say, it's a, you know, it'd be a, it'd probably a nice job to do actually. Are there any courses um, that you've come across, or when you've been speaking to people, they said, you know, my background was in this, or I trained in this. Are there any kind of specific? um technical courses that you've come across that you think actually that would be a really good opener into this type of work or or this area yeah so um there are a number of courses that run at shrivenham um going from i think uh, a few days 
all the way through to a whole year uh, MSc in modeling and simulation. Um, I, I, so I, I would, yeah, I mean, there are courses. I mean, in fact, the problem is even, forget about industry, uh, I think the problem within MOD and military, and I think everyone recognizes this, there's not enough suit to be qualified and experienced personnel in, in this sort of area. So really, I think people are crying out. So, I mean, I also think on the job training, you know, and learn, you know, if you've got a job in this area and learning about it, ask questions. And because I think sometimes people have, well, I know I have been in that. You, you're kind of afraid to ask questions, but there's no, <laughs> I think, <laughs> ask questions, find out, you know, definitely. And uh, I think that that's to, to do that. But uh, yeah, look up some of these courses. I think any skills in the sort of digital side are going to be useful okay anything to do with programming uh yeah well not necessarily hardcore programming but anything that you've got a kind of curiosity curiosity about this technology in fact what we're seeing is that because some of this technology is relatively cheap now uh some of it not the whole metaverse <laughs> but you know elements of it like you know uh, vr headsets are so relatively inexpensive now compared to say even a laptop they're cheaper that we're seeing where military are actually just getting hold of them and and giving it a go and you know we've we've seen them actually used for uh i've you know spoken to people where they've actually used them for 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 trying to visualize where they were going ahead of doing it for for you know some operation so it's actually being so yeah some yeah some of it maybe just try and do it locally yeah I think that's a really interesting point because I guess the generation that are coming through the military now are the generation that grew up gaming more so yeah. than, you know, maybe my generation who had Game Boys and things like that. Um, and do you think, do you think that it's this gamification of training is preparing people for the real battlefield adequately enough? I mean, I, in fact, I, I recently wrote a little thing about gamification, but I'm not an expert. But I, I think if it's about making training fun <laughs> or education fun, so you're more likely to want to do it, then I, I think it's it's got to be a good thing. The thing is, sometimes it gets mixed up with um, just gaming in general. And I, I, I think it's really interesting, the esports, which whether you include gamification in that, where we're seeing each of the services are really, you know, enthused about what they're doing. They're working with the other services, uh, setting up tournaments. So I, I think that, you know, talking about the next generation, yeah, that that needs to be encouraged because, in a way, you could set up if you put security to one side. I'm sure the gaming generation could set up their own military metaverse, actually, quite easily, yeah. connect, connecting everything up. Um, and even then, you know, maybe sticking on VPNs or whatever. So, yeah, we've seen that. And we have seen military where they, particularly where you've got reservists there, who maybe their day job is in the digital world. I think, um, yeah, that's very exciting. I think that should that should all be encouraged myself much more than it is. I I think there's a bit of nodding, saying, oh, yes, very good. But I'm not sure how much support they're getting. I mean, I I liken it to, you know, I when, many years ago when I was played rugby, I you can't see that I'm not actually that tall. <laughs> I'm not, but I was told it was very good for me. Rugby It was good for the good for the spirit and team and all that. Well, I I think uh, esports is uh, is a similar kind of idea. Rep. Okay, not running around on a grass pitch, but I I think we're also seeing uh, esports going into school curriculums now, where because they're seeing they're really good for teamwork, communications, leadership, all that good stuff. So yeah, that. I think that's a very, if I've answered the question about gamification, I think that's a really interesting area that uh, could be encouraged, you know, more than it is really. Um, yeah, so I was, um, I also was reading, um, there's an Olympic sport, which I can't remember, it's Korean. It's a bit like karate, I think, or judo. And you can play, so you're playing physically, uh, but you've got like uh, where, you know, you've got, um, your body's being tracked by whatever, maybe bracelets on your arms and legs, and you can then compete with someone anywhere in the world. So you're getting all that physical fitness. You're not actually hitting them, 
but you are actually competing because the machine works out how well you're hitting them. So I think that's going to be really interesting ideas of mixing kind of the live world and the digital world. I mean, it's just a lot of this is just up to your imagination, really. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. guess that's kind of both the scary prospect and the one that, you know, should be inspiring people, um, especially anybody who is listening to this, hopefully having been converted to find out more about the kind of roles that are available um, with some of the some of the companies that you've mentioned. Um, if um, in terms of events, because you mentioned some events um, when we first began talking, um, if there are people on resettlement at the moment who just want to kind of walk the boards, um, talk to people from these companies, are there any good events that happen within the UK or, or Europe that they can attend and just get a feel for what's happening in the industry? Yeah, so I, I would say the, the nearest one is DSEI. I think they're actually going to be, it's a bit of a heavy metal show, but I think if you can get there, there's going to be quite a lot of simulation training companies there. So I would, I would recommend uh, that if you can make it there. Um, it's rather pushing it. Uh, if you can, if you ask um, some people, a lot of people go to a thing called IETSEC, which mm -hmm. is the international inter-service something or another. <laughs> and that's held every year in, in Orlando, beginning of, uh, December. Um, that's huge. That's 15,000 people, maybe at least. Uh, next year, uh, next March, I think, uh, or April, sorry, is iTech, which is in London, back at Excel. And then that's definitely worth going. And then definitely worth going is DSET, which is Defence Simulation Education Training, which is run in Bristol. So if you can get there, and that's free for the military to attend. So that's quite a few. I think also just look online. I mean, there's, there's loads of events and uh, things just, you know, if catch up on YouTube with some things that have been talked about in this area. Uh, yeah. So just just type in metaverse or military <laughs> metaverse and away you go. So, uh, yeah, there's loads of stuff online. Not not unsurprisingly. <laughs> well, I think that's that's why it's been so good talking to you because um, I know when I started researching it, I was slightly overwhelmed. It was a bit of a hit of infobesity and kind of really honing in on what it means and what the industry looks like and who you should be targeting. I think you've you've nailed that for us this evening because I think anyone listening can probably you know, rewind, write down some company names, write down the events they need to target, preferably the Orlando one, because I mean, he doesn't <laughs> want to go to Orlando. Um, and um, I think that really yeah. helps give some of our listeners some really good tips and insights into the industry. So thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, uh, the other obvious point is please read ms and Military Simulation and Trading, because that has got all the latest news and subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, uh, hopefully we'll put the link in your thing. So uh, I definitely worth uh, looking at MS&T. Brilliant. Well, you I'll get definitely... a global view on what's going on. Yeah. Fantastic. We will put a link to ms and in the bio. Is it subscription based or is it? Um, oh no, it's uh, it's it's free. The newsletter is free. In fact, as far as I know, it's all um, no charge. Fantastic. If it's free, give it to me. Um, I'm sure people will be very, very happy with that. And I'm I'm pretty sure you'll have some subscriptions as well in the Definitely, yeah. Please, please do. I'll, I'll get I'll get a bonus if you do. <laughs> no, <laughs> do you have a discount code that we can use? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's free. <laughs> oh yeah, we don't need that. We need a referral code. <laughs> yeah. If it's free, you're not gonna get any commission. No, oh, it's, it's okay. I I do it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, all good. Very happy to uh, to to help Emerson T. Yeah. So Join, join the join the newsletter. Brilliant. Thank and also, we much. we also support uh, Warfighter Podcast. Uh, if you just do search for that Warfighter Podcast, um, and that is a great. Uh, there are other podcasts out, but that we as MS and T we support that one. I'm for I'm on there talking about the latest news. We're slightly between seasons at the moment, but we had a whole season and really have a listen to the, some really great articles. If you're maybe in a, on a bus or driving or whatever, have a listen to those podcasts, Warfighter podcasts. It, although it says Warfighter, 
it's it's principally about simulation and training. So we've covered an awful lot in in that in the last last season. So please, if we can put a link to that as well. Yeah, that link will be in the bio as well. So um, that's brilliant. What a veritable feast of um, research that you've thrown up for people to do if they want to get into. Absolutely. Um, that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I didn't mean thrown up in that way. I mean, um, no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it will be a test yeah. afterwards. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Andy, for joining us. And for anyone um, listening, those links will be in the bios. And if you are not a member of TechVets yet, then please go to www.techvets.co and join us as a member because it will unlock lots of opportunities, free training and events that you can attend in the future. So thank you, MD. And um, it would be great to catch up with you again in the future when the tech has evolved yet again. <laughs> well, we're, we're, maybe we'll do it in the metaverse more than this. We'll be yeah. avatars. I'll be, I'll be 20 years old or something. <laughs> Yeah, I will definitely take some. Pain. <laughs> so, Mer Meredith, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been it's a great pleasure, and I, I think this is a great charity. And uh, yeah, so you know, all the all the best. And uh, if anyone wants to reach me on LinkedIn, uh, please do. Okay, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Andy. Alrighty, thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> my pleasure. <laughs>